our ministry, we have over 440 churches just as a family of families. So it's, it's kind of where are you going to say no, yes, because every time you say yes, you say no to 10 other places. But, uh, but when I saw the way that you love and uh, just the way you love and value people, and when I saw that in Washington, D.C., people that know how to love well and are keeping the love on, I just realized because part of my assignment is to go to the places in the world where nobody would go. And that was part of my assignment as a, as a Baptist pastor and uh, as a Norwegian. And some of you have heard the story that Randy Clark, uh, the two stories he always talks about is a Heidi Baker and Leif Hetland. And that was uh, June 6, 1995, Randy Clark came to this Baptist pastor. And it was a small group together. And my biggest dream back then was to see my Baptist church go from 185 to 200. <laughs> that was my, I was a big dreamer. <laughs> but then we had a couple of people that died. So I had to go out and evangelize more just to try. <laughs> so I was, almost, I was almost burned out. I mean, it was a hard, hard work to be a big dreamer. I mean, I, I almost needed the Holy Spirit to fulfill the dream. It's like, wow. <laughs> but then as a Baptist pastor, uh, when Randy came in, and I remember one of my elders says, Pastor, you're very, very dry. And uh, somehow uh, my desperation level was greater than my fear level. So I made a decision to go there to the meeting. And we stood in a small a little group of pastors was there. And as Randy went down the line, said, touch him, bless him, fill him. And he went down the line. And everybody, whoo, they went down to the ground. And when he came to me, he stops. And he looks at me and he says, you are a bulldozer. And I was thinking, no, I'm a Baptist pastor. <laughs> I mean, I didn't know much about prophecies. So it was like, uh, and then the next moment, he looks at me. So everybody else just got touched, blessed, filled. But he says, I see you're going to go into the darkest places in the world. When nobody's ever been before, you're like a bulldozer, and you're making a road and a way where there is no way. And thousands of people are following after you. And in the next moment, the power of God hit me. Just one encounter from God can change everything. Just one touch from the master's hand can change everything. One word from God can change everything. So it was just one encounter. So I ended up on the floor for the next two hours. There was a mixture between electricity and fire. I was just being electrocuted on the floor. And then uh, when I came up from that, I didn't know what had hit me. And uh, I remember very clearly, we lived in a place called Sunness. It's a little town of about 50,000 people. And now I walk by some of the heroin addicts that I used to. But when I walked by them, they suddenly started to manifest. And it's like the presence that was upon me started to touch people. And I couldn't see people the same way I did before. I, I suddenly have some new glasses because I didn't see people the way they are, but the way they're going to be. Well, you don't treat people based upon their history, but their destiny. So something started to take place in my life. But what I didn't know, that right now I had become impregnated with God. And I would carry something. And then there was another prophet that came up to me and said, Wow, I see over one million Muslims is going to get saved through you. And I was thinking, <laughs> one million. I don't even know one Muslim. I mean, you can imagine, I mean, it's some of you that are here. I mean, my story, I mean, I came from a very good family. But when I was about 12 years old, some painful things took place in my life. And because of that, there was a lot of pain and shame. And you need to remember that pain always seeks pleasure. So when there's this hidden core pain in your life, so for me, uh, religion couldn't do. So as a result of that, I ended up in rebellion. So my story, just to give you a very short summary, I ended up as a prodigal son. So from the time I started to use drugs then at the age of 13, and by the time I was 18, I was about 99 pounds, suicidal, and uh, didn't have a whole lot of hope. Uh, but then the good news is Jesus came. He saved me, healed me, delivered me. The bad news was I went to church. <laughs> and I went from being rebellious to become religious. I don't know which one was worse, but I went from being a prodigal son to become a prodigal brother. And so this whole next journey in my life now, I'm, I'm out on the field for all these years working for God because I didn't know how to work from God. And I learned how to be an achiever, but I didn't know how to be a receiver. 
So tonight, part of what I wanted to do is, first of all, uh, as I'm saying, that it, it was a long journey, and hopefully through this week, and I can help, because what I'm interested in is if, if you have a seed, how do you take that seed? And that's what happened in June 6, 1995. What Randy Clark gave me was a seed. But how does that seed become a tree that becomes a forest that becomes a paper industry? So how do you get that seed from one word that God speaks and that process that you go through until that becomes a harvest over a million? I want to show you the video because I do that as an honor. I just came from Randy's school a couple of days ago. We came in yesterday, and we've been there, and, and we're sending love from Charles Stock to you, Papa Charles Stock. I know he is a papa here to this house. Uh, we were there on uh, Wednesday and ministered to them, and the whole church came forward. It was just a major baptism of love uh, uh, there at the Life Center in Harrisburg. And then we partied with Georgian on Tuesday night and all of his wild people. And then, and then we've been also at Global Awakening School for three days, and it's been a wonderful week. And then right before that in New Haven. So this is meeting, I think, number 14 in the last week. <laughs> and I'm still smiling. So I wanted to, to show you and take your trip to Pakistan. This was, I was watching on CNN like some of us do with terrorism. So sometimes when you say, oh, look in the neighborhood, it is very dark. Or you don't understand, you're a blonde-headed, blue-eyed Norwegian. I mean, people say that to me, and it's like, well, if you think this is dark, let me take you to the darkest places in the world. And when people say, oh, there's a lot of religious spirit here, I say, let me show you the Taliban. And you're going to see that you don't have a whole lot of religious spirit. You're actually living under the open heaven. I think that some of us, the only closed heaven, like my friend Bill Johnson says, is between our ears. But we are living under the open heaven. And heaven is so attracted to the Christ in you. So I wanted just to take you on a journey so you can see Pakistan. And the reason I'm doing that, because it gives authenticity some of the things I talk about. Because when you're seeing here on this video... They burned down 200 Christian homes. 80 Christian businesses was burned down. Mass persecution started to take place. And I'm watching it on CNA, uh, CNN, and I was just weeping in Atlanta. And I decided, let's go over there. It's time to change the environment. Because you and I, we can be environment changer. If this environment has changed, then we can change the environment around us. So we went in there with a clear assignment. And over three days period of time, we finally rented a big cricket stadium. And that's when you saw we passed the million mark. Just in a matter of three days, in the darkest places in the world, 87,000 people got saved. And then you'll see on the video also, we had over 30,000 healing. And in one night, the fire of God just came from heaven. And 3,000 created miracles in one night. That was create a miracle. Blind eyes, deaf ears, limbs being straightened. So anyway, let's take a little trip to Pakistan and we can begin. I just uh, wanted to thank every single one of you for uh, giving and praying so that I have an opportunity to go to Pakistan. Uh, it is such a joy to be able to be back home, uh, to be able to see everyone, and to be alive. It was a wonderful, wonderful trip. We're still breathing, cause we have seen the hope of your healing rising from our soul.
और अब आप अकेले की तरह नहीं रहे आप खुदा के बेटे और बेटियां बन गए हैं आपका जो तारक है खुदा की बादशाही के साथ Can we give Jesus a good hand? I think that the encouragement that I would like to be to each one of you that uh, small is the new big in the kingdom. Let me say that one more time. Small is actually the new big in the kingdom. And uh, one is the new majority. It, it doesn't take more than one person and you one person in love and you can change the whole environment. And we are seeing it now city by city, it's uh, country after country. It's just been amazing to see now for for our journey lately just to see how the environment of heaven is just coming down. We have seen three different times when the presence of God is just coming into meeting. And every single person, one meeting we just had not long ago, where we had over a thousand people, sick people, and we had a whole ministry team with us that was going to be part of it. Tumors and everything else, but the presence of God just came in. And when the presence of God came in, everything changed. Cancer disappeared, blind eyes was open, and we didn't pray for anyone. When we finally was going to have the ministry team praying, everybody was healed. It's happened three times now. I mean, because when Jesus shows up, good things happen. But part of my dream and what I'm imagining is actually that that's the presence of Jesus that changes everything. But also one of the things that I've been on a journey in my own life, and, and this is just to be honest with you, sometimes in one moment for me, I can experience in the presence, the environment is changing. When the presence of God is there, <laughs> There's nothing like it when the environment of heaven is there. And, and I'm not saying that the presence of God but is not in you, but when it is also upon you. There is nothing more beautiful in the world. Because, so, so what I'm saying, so how do we host the presence of God? I, I don't want to just have a visitation in a meeting. But how, how do I have habitation? It, it, is there anybody else that would like to experience that? Wow. The same presence that is upon us. Uh, I, I have to share this one more story, testimony. It's just that it's hard for me to do without crying. But we, uh, we were over in England, actually. We did a global awakening conference for Europe. And I got a call from Washington, D.C., which is close by, where some of the government and other ones, they want to bring 200 evangelical leaders and some Muslim leaders of America, especially after what happened uh, in Paris. So I, I was going to fly home, so I stopped by in Leicester, and in Leicester I met with a group of Sunni Muslims, Shia Muslims. They escaped Iraq and Iran and Syria, what you're reading on. So, so, but they heard that I love Muslims. And when I found out that I, I, I didn't dislike Muslims, because most of the Christians, they went around with signs that makes you wonder. Well, I came with a sign that makes you wonder. It is these signs that shall follow the ones that believes. Not so, so somebody just came and told them about there that I, this, there's this guy and he really loved Muslims. So a group of them gathered, they were wondering about this guy. So anyway, they met with me one night before I flew to D.C. Uh, from London. So we met in Leicester and, and again to see these people. They came into Europe and they came to escape persecution. And many of them are also radical Muslims. But they came and then they're meeting Jesus in Europe. So they all laid on the floor. Their faces shined almost like a sun afterwards. And then the testimonies to see the Shia Muslims, Sunni Muslims, they're going to be the next Apostle Pauls. I mean, they're all on the road to Damascus, and they're having a Jesus encounter. And then they're coming into Europe, and now they're going back again. If they get kicked out of Europe, we have missionaries in Iran, Iraq and Syria, full of the Spirit. So I'm saying this, but I came to D.C., and there was three top Muslim leaders, and one of them, and I cannot mention his name because I know things are online here, but, uh, but as I say, this person, I had watched him on television in the Middle East. 60 to 100 million people are watching him, and it's kind of a little scary setting. Three years earlier, the first time I saw him on television, I was a little intimidated. I felt kind of a fear because I was in the Middle East 
and you had early prayer in the morning, and there's all this spirit realm going on. And the Holy Spirit said, do you see this guy? I want you to meet him. I said, I don't want to meet him. <laughs> the Holy Spirit again whispered, I want you to meet him. I said, I don't want to meet him. And the third time, I said, okay, let me try. So I sent my coordinator to his headquarters, and he came back and said, it's impossible. We cannot get to his secretary of his secretary to get to him. So I thought, whoo, I'm off the hook. <laughs> At least I was obedient. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit just whispered to me, says, Leif, I didn't ask you to try to see him. I said, I want you to see him. So I was thinking, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> and he says, good. And I said, that's impossible. Well, even better. So maybe you're going to need me. Anyway, to make the story short, he said, I want you to turn on the TV again. I turn on the TV. And this guy is as big as Oprah would be here. I mean, everybody knows him. So I turn on the TV. And when I see him on TV, I'm just like, wow. And then the Holy Spirit said, what do you see? And normally speaking, I would tell you what I see in the sense of the natural. But that's illegal in the kingdom. Uh, because I had to see him the way that God sees him. I have to think about him the way that God thinks about him. Feel what God feels about him. I have to see the future him. So when you see the terrorist Saul stoning and being involved in the stoning of Stephen, you see the apostle Paul writing, there, love is patient, love is kind, there does not envy. So do you give him the love word of the year before he's become it. Now, I know this kind of a thinking can lead to dancing, so be very careful. <laughs> so, I was, so I was watching, I was watching this guy, and the Holy Spirit said, what do you see? And then in the next moment, I just waited because I wanted to hear what Papa, and I see, I see a man of peace. I see a peacemaker. And I just started to get teared up, and I was like, that's what I see. And then eventually, what are you going to do? And I'm thinking and I'm waiting for Papa to whisper. I'm going to give him the peace award of the year. So the guy I'm seeing on television, we created this big glass sculpture. And I have two American leaders with me. One is Dr. Bob Phillips. And we are heading over there to his headquarters with a big glass sculpture that evening. And we're going to present him before 100 imams and all of these people. We're going to present him with a peace award of the year. This is before we become a peacemaker. He's getting the peace award of the year. Isn't that why you were yet sinner, Christ died for you? Why you were still in your mess? He saw the gold in the middle of all the mud. He saw the diamond and rough in your life. So God has been on this journey with me. To make this story short, uh, just recently after the DC event, he came to Atlanta where we live and he met in my office, and we were sitting there, and he was opening up the Al-Quran, their holy book, and he was reading some verses. This guy had memorized the whole Al-Quran by the time he was 12 years old. One of the most brilliant scholars, and he's part of an Islamic ideology council, so he, he is sitting and reading some verses from the Al-Quran for me. And then suddenly the Holy Spirit, the presence of God just started to fill my office. And I could just feel it's like, whoo. And I'm trying to concentrate to be able to look him at because I don't want to dishonor, but I start to feel oh, it's getting heavier. And I was thinking, God, this is not a good time. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm starting to feel like, whoo, it's getting heavier, heavier in here. And finally, he is the one that stopped because I, I'm not going to say anything. And he said, oh, well, what's going on in here? <laughs> and I'm like, well, uh, what do you mean? And he says, I feel from the top of my head is tingling. And it goes down in my, uh, in my body. And, and then I feel like these waves is going up, up and down. Like, well, what is that? I, I didn't give him any answer. I left him with some questions. Excuse me. But I had enough favor in my favorite card. Uh, this is important to understand that if you didn't have three years of favor with him, I wouldn't be able to do this. That means I hadn't taken any withdrawals. I had just added value. So I put my hand over his head. And then I didn't know afterwards that he had had a stomach condition, certain food he couldn't eat. And he walks to Wyndham Hotel the next morning at the buffet. And he can't eat, but he eats all this food that he's allergic. So he's totally healed. 
And then in the next moment, the next day I come and he has two wives. One Syrian wife, one Pakistani wife, and nine children with his two wives. And when I come to the hotel, and they are in the Middle East, so he said, can, can you also give them what I got? So they are actually, his oldest son is on Skype, and we release, and the presence of God's filled up that room. And so there's an atmosphere change that starts to take place there. But it doesn't stop that way. The, the next day that before he's going to go to the airport, he says, I need to go to your office. I say, no, we need to go to the airport. You were speaking in a mosque in San Diego. Then you go to Sacramento. And I have promised all these imams that you're going to get there on time. And, and you are their leader. So we, we, we have to honor. He said, no, but I have to go to your office. And after a little five minutes back and forth, we went to the office. And, we, and he says, I want to sit in that chair. And I want to experience it one more time. <laughs> and uh, this time, the glory of God came in. We couldn't move. There was such a weight of God's glory in there. But when he went back again to the Middle East before, I mean, he could walk through a setting. You will never see anything. It would be an inshallah. God is just going to do what he wants to do. But he doesn't realize something has happened with him. He sees sick people. He sees women, and he feels the pain because they cannot even look. But he suddenly recognized this. That, so he sets an ad in the paper. I'm going to show it to you tomorrow because I have it on the phone. An ad in a national paper and telling the sick people, everybody come to this mosque. And women who are barren and people that are oppressed come here. And there's going to be healing prayer in Jesus' name. So on November 15th, there was in a mosque full, and I'm in the Philippines with a thousand of our leaders in the Philippines. And right before we're there, in the next moment, as I'm saying this, this call comes in. And I go and find Wi-Fi and do a WhatsApp. And I call him, and, and, and he said, I don't know, but the whole mosque is full, and there's people outside. And there's Shia, most many imams are here, but I don't know what to do. <laughs> and... Uh, and I said, just close your eyes, and it's going to be okay. And because, again, I have to use a covert language. Sometimes there's a covert. There's overt revival, but there's also covert. Sometimes you can go into a community, change the whole environment in there, because perfect love casts out fear. So you can take away, eliminate fear by leaking love into the setting. And then afterwards, people say, what, did, what just happened to me before I was full of fear? And the atmosphere starts to change. So we're going to learn also in this season because what we are beholding, we are becoming. And what we become, we can leak. <laughs> you teach what you know, but you reproduce what you are. So we're going to learn a little bit about that. But what I'm interested in here was, so in the month, what he does, he closes his eyes and he gets a vision. And he sees me, and I'm in the Philippines. He's in the Middle East. And he sees me, and then behind me, there's this big person with open hands like this, Jesus Christ. And then he just pray a prayer. He doesn't know what he's prayed. The mass healing starts to break loose. And now we've been in touch on a regular basis. I'm heading over next month. And it's just, there's these amazing things that God is doing in this season. Listen, do not listen to the bad news. Do not be distracted by what the devil is doing. Focus on what God is doing. I am so excited about what God is doing in America. Everywhere I go in America, including one. I was just up in Connecticut and people are talking about this guy. That, they, all these Muslims are coming in and we went into the, their own shops and everything else. It's almost like some of these Muslims are coming over. And when we walked in, I'm like, wow, I'm like under the open heaven. I want to move to Connecticut. Why go over to the Middle East? Middle East is coming to your neighborhood. <laughs> but it was so beautiful to see one of the key Muslims there in church. He's sitting on the second row because you just loved on him. You loved on him without any agenda. The environment changed. And even there, he come up and just hugged and squeezed me. And then in the next moment, he said, tell the peace people that I am giving my life to Jesus. That was a gateway church in New Haven, Connecticut. So I'm just saying that God is doing something. And, and the best way I can help us with this, because when you're hearing stories like that, you say, wow, well, oh, this is kind of a mind-boggling. This is kind of a stretching. You saw the video. It breaks every paradigm, doesn't it? 
Because I believe to some degree we've been abnormal for so long that when the normal happens, and Jesus is normal. And normal Christian life is just to live the Jesus life. Sons and daughters with a dove. Not with pigeons. So what I want to do today is I will describe the language to you. And we're going to do the same in the morning. So this is actually, some people said, well, I saw that at the voice of the apostle when 7,000 people was there. And I've seen it. My friend Bill Johnson on my birthday. Wow, Leif, thank you for helping me to stay in chair number one. That was his birthday greeting. So what I'm saying here is that this has been creating a language that can help you. Because in a moment, you know the dove is there. And in the next moment, there's pigeons. And, and there's very, very big difference, isn't it? In one moment, the presence is there. But what happened in a moment, we could sense that presence had lifted. And we're not aware. But if I can help you that as soon as that happened, that you can get back underneath a open heaven. Then I can help you. I can help your life, and then eventually, hopefully tomorrow morning, we can do a little surgery. Get rid of the black hole in your soul. We maybe even have to do an orphanectomy. <laughs> an orphanectomy. We, we remove the orphan way of thinking and the orphan spirit. And you get a baptism of love. You get immersed in the Father's love, and you start to love you the way that Papa God loves you. Then you love your neighbor as you love yourself. So are you ready? Yes. Okay. I have these three chairs with me. Can you see those three chairs from back there? Can you see them? They are here at least. So if you can't see them, I just, if not, use your imagination, but you can stand or whatever. But there's three chairs here. This is chair number one. Which chair is this? This is chair number two. Which chair is this? And here is another chair. This chair is chair number three. Okay, let's try it again. Chair number... Oh, wonderful. Chair number one, if you're living your life, and I want you to know, every single person in the world, in the world today, there are 7.4 billion people. I know that's a large number, and I don't expect you to know about 7.4 billion people. But in the world today, the world has kind of become a big orphanage. With 7.4 billion people. All of those people live their life in one of these three chairs. Actually, everyone in this room, you live your life out of one of these three chairs. Every one of you that are married, you either have a chair number one marriage or two or three. If you are a businessman, you are either a chair number one businessman or a two or a three. All of these, this works on every area of your life. If you look at finances, you either have a chair number one way of thinking or two or three. So are you ready? Chair number one, if you live your life in chair number one, it is about the kingdom of God. Say kingdom of God. Kingdom of God. If you're living in chair number two, it's about the kingdom of self. Say kingdom of self. Kingdom of self. And if you live in chair number three, it is the kingdom of the world. Say kingdom of the world. Kingdom of the world. Are you okay? So what is chair number one? Chair number two? Kingdom of self. Oh, you're amazing. Now we can go deeper. If you live in chair number one, you are saved. Say the word saved. saved. If you're living in chair number two, you are saved. Say the word saved. saved. Chair number three, you are lost. Say lost. lost. That means if you were to die today, you will not go to heaven because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by Him. The people living here are lost. Can you say lost? lost. If you're living in chair number one, and now we're going to move a little bit deeper. It is the Spirit-filled life. Say Spirit-filled life. The Bible says walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the desires of your flesh. The key to conquer the flesh is to learn how to walk in the Spirit. The Bible says the kingdom is not about eating or drinking, chapter number two, but it is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom is in the Spirit, and when you are in the Spirit, there's righteousness, peace, and joy everywhere you go. But if you're living in chair number two, it is a different way. Because you live a soulish life. Say soulish life. You are saved and you will get to heaven. Are you hearing me? The problem is heaven is not getting to you. There is a big difference. You're born again. 
But many of the people that are living in Chernobyl 1, instead of having the beautiful dove, say dove. You're living with pigeons, say pigeons. If you're in chair number one, you can hear his voice. Say, hear his voice. Because the Bible says, my sheep hears my voice. And if you're in chair number one, you are a prophetic people. Say, prophetic people. But if you're in chair number two, this is chair number two, you're not hearing his voice clearly. Why? Because there's all this noise. So when God speaks, it has to filter its way through your emotion, will, mind, and personality to touch your spirit. Because your soul is the dominating force. The people in chair number one is all about them. Give me, touch me, fill me, bless me, 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 me. That is chair number two. So I have a friend of mine. His name is Lenny LeBlanc. Lenny LeBlanc, he wrote a song. There is none like you. No one else can touch my heart like you do. Do you remember that song? Lenny LeBlanc. But the people that are living in chair number two, they are singing this song. There is none like me. (laughs) Here it is. Oh, come, let us adore me. (laughs) What we're seeing is there's a whole generation of believers that is going to get to heaven, but their life is all about them. Like one lady in Australia, she came up to us in a conference and says, Oh, Brother Leif, I saw you on Sidroth on television, and I traveled all the way to see you, but I want you to know that the, uh, I've been looking forward to your teaching, and, and I've been looking so much forward, but I didn't like the worship. I said, that's okay. The worship was not for you. It was for him. <laughs> but so many different people, well, I didn't like church. Well, well, because often in chair number two, we're more like an orphanage. And all these orphans are coming together. And it is manifested in two ways, either in rebellion or religion. I have to say that one more time. So the people are living in chair number two. The churches in chair number two is operating more like orphanages. Self is in the center. And we can build as many programs as people like. And you will have two different tendencies. One of them is the prodigal son tendency. They will value God. They will value the pastor. They will value the musician. They will value everybody about what they're going to do for me. But it is actually about me. Touch me, bless me, fill me, 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 me. And if you don't, then I go to another church that meets my needs. But there's another group of people in chain number two. And they are just manifested instead of rebellion. They are religious. They are saying, look what I'm doing for God. Their value system is still what I do. Because what I do, then I have. And if I have, then I become. That's chair number two. Orphan 101. Say it with me. Say, I do. Let's say it again. Say, I do. do. Then I have. Then I become. So our value system that we perform and we do certain things, and based on what we do, then we will have. And based upon what we have, that's how we get our value system we become. But chair number one is different. Chair number one is, say, I am. And because I am, I am a son. Say, I'm a son. And if you're a daughter, that's okay. Let me help you, ladies. Ladies, you are sons. All of you ladies tell me, I am a son. son. And all of you guys tell me, I'm a bride. (laughs) Listen, if all of us guys are going to be the bride of Christ for eternity, you ladies can be sons temporary, okay? (laughs) It is the spirit of sonship that says, Abba, Father. It is not about male or female. So it is very important to see there's no gender in this. It is a family thing, sons and daughters. So you are sons. But in this chair, I am. I am a son. And because I'm a son, I have. And because of what I have, I do. Can you see the difference? Let me me help you. It is not what you do, chair number two. It is not what you do that makes you who you are. It is who you are that makes you do what you do. I have to say that one more time. Chair number two. 
It is not what I do that makes me who I am. It is actually who I am that makes me do what I do. Let me use one more language so I can capture you. Say it with me. Say, I believe. believe. That's chair number two. Say, I believe. I I behave. behave. Then I belong. Isn't that what we do? Oh, now when you're saved, you do all these different things. Then you're going to get value. The whole religious. And so many of us, we're on the performance treadmill. Oh, you got a C plus? Next time you can get a B if you just work a little bit harder on your devotion. (laughs) Why, chair number one is very different. I wake up in the morning with an A plus on my report card. That's before I've taken the exam. I've already won before I make the shot. I know it's a different way of thinking. It is when you start to think about you the way that Papa God thinks about you. Before Jesus had done one healing, one miracle, he had an A+. This is my, and this is my beloved. This is my beloved son whom I love and whom I am well pleased. This is before I had done anything. Why was he affirmed by the Father before he did everything? Because the first orphan, his name was Lucifer. Lucifer was a worship leader in heaven. And Lucifer, in heaven as a beautiful worship leader, the Father God loved with a perfect love in a perfect place. But Lucifer didn't love Lucifer the way that Papa God loved Lucifer. So Lucifer was thinking, if I become like him, I'm going to feel better about myself. I want to be like the Most High, Isaiah 14. And then what that leads to is, if I do something, then I will have something and I will become something. What do we say in the garden? If you eat from this tree, then you're going to feel better about yourself. Then you're going to be like Papa. You have to do something to become something. It was the serpent in the garden. And you end up in chair number two. And eventually, as a result of that, in chair number three, we have one and a half billion Muslims, over a billion Hindus. We have darkness. We have poverty. We have child trafficking. We have all this darkness. And the problem in chair number three, we don't have a darkness problem. We have a lack of light. And the biggest reason that this world is living in this darkness, the very reason that everywhere I travel in the Middle East, when I see all those people, the horrific evil and the darkness that I'm seeing in chair number three, is because of we have a whole church in chair number two. So part of my assignment is I'm writing three books in this series to add value to us. My assignment, what, if, what would take place if each one of us, first of all, will wake up in the morning, that we would start to see ourselves the way that Papa God sees us? What if you started to think about you the way that He thinks about you? Let me just ask you, uh, or, or challenge you a little bit. What if you knew you the way that He knows you? The Bible says even before you were in your mother's womb, He knew you. The Bible says in Psalm 139, very, very clearly that. But he also says in Ephesians 1 and in Ephesians 1, 6, he talks about even before the foundation of the world, he had you in his mind. So who are you? Okay, let me, if there's a little bit of religion around here, let me just touch that for a moment. There were 50 million sperm cells, 50 million sperm cells, all of them on the race towards a dropping egg cell. And you won. Give yourself a good hand. You won. You are one out of 50 million. Congratulations. You are a winner. You started out well and you're going to end well. Gee, number one. <laughs> So I'm saying that to each one of us. What happened to me? I, I, I want you to capture this. For a few seconds, I want you to capture In my own life, while I was in my mother's womb, 1965. I know I don't look that old. 
My mom didn't know she was pregnant with me. And as a result of that, she had to have a surgery. Why is that? Because she carried an ambassador of love without knowing it. But the enemy knew about it. So the enemy attacked while I was in my mother's womb. She lived in fear during the pregnancy. And the reason I'm saying that, if you tell me your story, tell me where the devil has attacked you. Tell me about your child, even when you're in your mother's womb. Tell me where the enemy has been going after you, and I can tell you what your destiny is. Because where the serpent has bitten you, eventually we'll have the greatest authority. Why would he try to kill all the baby boys? Because Moses, the deliverer, is coming. Why is he trying to kill the baby boys? Because Jesus, the Savior, is coming. Whoa! And that's when I see different individuals and I'm seeing where the enemy maybe sees trash, I see treasure. And it is my life as the saying, what happened to me when I was 12 years old that the enemy was trying to shut me down? Because there was an ambassador of love. So all of my life it was fear. I was being attacked by fear. Because do you know what is going to cast out fear? Perfect love is going to cast out fear. I want you to know that I know you believe in God, but God believes in you. So my dear friends and family, part of my heart this week is God believes in you. Tomorrow I'm going to probably deal with it, but God gave me an experiment. And actually we've had uh, several of the Bethel teachers that was with us uh, but they went with us with teams to the Philippines, and they got to see some of that. It was Therese and Kevin, but we also had quite a few other ones. We had teams year after year that went with us to the Philippines. But 10 years ago, I got an assignment, 400 poor Filipinos that nobody believed in. And I traveled across the world, meeting with two of them that was broken and beaten up. And today, as I'm saying, uh, the joy was just God says, no, I want you to release their identity. And then actually give them their dignity back. I want them to, the original that I had for each one of them. Restore that back. And then release the dream over their life. Today, each one of them are world changers and history makers. I could talk about one person. If I had that one person here. And uh, Scotty, who is here with me, my personal assistant, he was just there. But I take, if I took one of those people with me who used to pick up trash in the street. Actually, he found a little Bible. That was the first time he read the Bible. He found a Bible. He was so shy when I first met him. If you will, he couldn't look at you at the knees. He would look at your feet when you talk to him. But today, he is the second place in the world in memorization. So he would, in this room right now, he would, you can mention your name and when you're born, everyone in this room. And he would remember everyone. Your name, the birthday, and then afterwards, he would say it backwards. We, we just had him in Vietnam, and he doesn't understand Vietnamese, and their names, I can't even remember two of them. <laughs> and we have all these leaders, but when he stood up there, one that used to pick up trash, but he started to get a renewed mind. He started to think about him the way that God thinks about him. He started to have the mind of Christ, and he started to see himself the way that God was seeing him. And he started to value himself the way that God was valuing him. He started to love himself the way that God loves him. He travels all over the world. He coaches like Pacquiao, the boxer, and his children, the world champion. He travels around our governments. He stands before leaders. He was just one of those people. And I could tell you story after story. I went to the Global Awakening School, and I had my son Paul from the Philippines there uh, early on in the year, and they all said, the favorite one of all of the teachers that has come in was that Paul Yauda, that Filipino. Just an ordinary person. So God says, if you take care of the ones that nobody wants, I give you the ones that everybody wants. Yeah. And we started with 400, and they are leading. We have had revival going on now in 12 nations, and the fire had continued to burn without burning out for 10 years. Because we're burning oil of intimacy with our lover. Because in chair number one, it is the hard work of rest. I say chair number one, it is the hard work of rest. Chair number one, rest is your weapon of warfare. And out of rest, you wear the enemy out.
Everything in chair number two is restless. I feel I need to do something. Chair number one, you're anointed. Say anointed. Chair number two, you're annoying. Say annoying. <laughs> chair number one, you are prophetic. Say prophetic. <laughs> chair number two, you are pathetic. Say pathetic. <laughs> and my wife knows that because there's moments when I'm in chair number one and my wife is like, wow, she loves. But in the next moment, it's like, I go in chair number two sometimes. But what I have to do when I'm there, and that's what we're going to help you in the morning, because we all have sometimes fear. And everything in chair number two is fear-driven. The root of it is fear. All neuroscience is actually rooted in fear, the way you think. Chair number one, everything is love. Receiving love, become love, and give love. I have not given you a spirit of fear, 2 Timothy 1.7. But what I have given you is a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. It's like an eagle. Love, the whole body is love. And then the wings is wisdom and power. And you're going to be an environment changer. Because the eagle is resting and the wind is working. You don't flap, you soar. In chair number one, I see his face. I hear his voice. I feel his love. I experience his presence. And I just live in my father's pleasure. He is already well pleased with me. It's not based on what I do. It's based on what he has done. And when I, I'm, I'm, I know there's a time of doing. I'm just first wants us to get the alignment before we do the assignment. I want us first to be so we can become. Every time fear comes against me, it's an invitation for me to have an upgrade in love. So who he is is what I become. And now what I become is what I release. So my encouragement for each one of us, and I know I cannot go so much deeper. We have about 16 hours just on these three chairs. My heart is to get each one of you before this weekend is over. The chair number one will be the normal life for you. And if you live a chain number one life, you can have a chain number one marriage. Yeah. And if you have a chain number one marriage, then you certainly can raise up chain number one children. Yeah. And if you have chain number children and you become a chain number one family and you join a chain number one church, yeah. then you can see a chain number one city. And if we get chain number one cities where there is shalom, where there is rest on all sides and the enemy cannot go, When you're creating a culture that heaven is so attracted to. A culture that looks like a family. Chair number one is all about family. It is sons and daughters and fathers and mothers. They don't compete with one another. They complete one another. When one of you are hurting, we're all hurting. When one of you got cancer, the immune system of the body gets so healthy, it goes right towards cancer, and they cannot live there any longer. It is a safe culture in chair number one because it is a culture where you can be you. And I'm going to bless you to be you because everybody else is occupied. Let me say that one more time. I bless you to be you. Everybody else is occupied. Don't be a copy. Be an original. Don't be afraid of the scars that you have. I can show you my scars. I've had a broken neck. Broken back, broken leg, nine months in a body cast, 11 years of opiates just because of pain. That's after I started ministry. Tumor. So you maybe see those breakthroughs, but you have not seen the breakdowns. You have not seen how many times I faced death. Guns in my mouth, and I can tell you story after story after story. I've not had one day for the last 20 years without experiencing pain and attack. But my smile is a genuine smile. He is good. Papa God is so good and he's good all the time. There's never been one moment that he's not been smiling towards me. When I'm looking up, I can see his face. The enemy is the one that comes to kill, steal, and destroy. 
Jesus always comes to give life and life more abundantly. So part of my thing is, I, I got to experiment with chair number one. We have, what if we can take one of them into a company and they change the company? We took one chair number one person into the school system, they changed it. We had another place where it was the highest drugs in an area in Laguna, where was, they called it the killing fields because they threw their bodies after they shot them just in, in a dump and the body smelled. So they decided, let's just take one of our sons and daughters in there because one environment changer, the temperature of that person would change the temperature in that community. And that was a nice experiment. And now the children, they didn't have any school. They didn't have any education. They lived in severe poverty. And it's been amazing now to watch, to come into that community. And just we got the report that all of those kids are now honor students. A plus on the report card. I can tell you about Joanna who came to Singapore. She's a poor Filipino that's coming into Singapore in a large company. In that company, you're normally a servant. You're a nobody. But she started to solve some of the problems. She learned how to go into the secret place to get secrets. <laughs> and then she knew how to steward that, having wisdom. And now she's changing this company. And the byproduct of that is they have, the whole company has changed. The Buddhist, three different doctor degrees, one of the most brilliant authors, scientists who owns the company, he's been saved. And they paid now for a thousand public school teacher in Joanna's district, a company that was owned by Buddhists, but now has become saved. It's paying for all this work in Cambodia, Vietnam, and Philippines. Why am I sharing these stories? Because it can be an ordinary story. She, Joanna's just an ordinary person like you. I was a drug addict. I was a broken person that Jesus saved. The sadness was I was still ended up in chair number two. Because now after I got gloriously saved, delivered, and healed, I didn't know about chair number one. That's the reason I learned this whole language. And in the next moment, I'm getting an impartation. I go to college. I go to seminary. I climb the ladder. And by the year 2000, I'd seen a half a million people saved. I'd been to 50-some country. I was constantly out there. But with an orphan heart, living for God because I didn't know how to live from God. I knew Jesus and I knew the Holy Spirit very well, but I didn't know Papa. I'd had a baptism of water and I'd had a baptism of the Spirit, but I had not had a baptism of love. And there were still areas in my life that was not comfortable with love. And those areas, you're not comfortable with God because God is love. And you're going to try to fill those areas with something. Either it's going to be rebellion and you're going to always struggle with sin issues or it's going to be religion. And you're going to get into trying to do something for God to make you feel better. But I'm so glad that in the year 2000, I had a baptism of love experience. I was broken, tired, and I think that I would have destroyed my family if I hadn't had this baptism of love experience. And this is part of what I wanted to release over us tonight just as a starting point. Is that okay with you? Life Center just, I mean, we had everybody in Life Center. They're just like, wow, we, we need this. Charles Stock, all of these people, we just, we need this baptism of love. First of all, we have to receive love. I cannot love Muslims or love radicals if I have not received that love from Papa God. I cannot give you something I have not first received. Chin number one is all about receiving. It's learning to say, Papa, I want to receive. I want to receive your love, for God so loved the world. Let me make one more statement. You only have authority over what you love. So don't pray for your city if you don't love your city. Don't pray for your neighbor if you don't love your neighborhood. First capture your father's heart, his love, and then starts to love what he loves with his love. Are you okay? This baptism of love, this is the last story, and tomorrow we're going to continue, and we're going to talk a little bit about the orphan heart and the orphan spirit, how it affects us, how chair number two comes in. But I didn't know about it. I didn't know that this black hole in my soul, I mean, I'm in ministry, worldwide ministry. Randy Clark had laid hands on me. I have all this favor, doors open, but I'm broken on the inside. I still have this gap, this black hole in my soul. Because there's a place love has not touched yet. 
So in year 2000, a man named Jack Taylor, he called me and he says, son, we're going to have a father and son week and can you come down? Just a small group together. And I say, yes, Papa, I, I'm coming. So I came to this meeting and a, a guy named Dennis Jernigan, some of you have heard here. So Dennis Jernigan, he is a musician. He says, Leif, I have this song for you. And it is a daddy's song. And Dennis Jernigan, he started to play and he started to sing over me. And at a moment as he started to play and he started to sing, these waves and these waves of liquid love came. And he was just singing and singing. And for the next two hours, this Norwegian, if you prayed, if you came to me in 1999 and wanted to hug me, it was like hugging a tree stump. <laughs> I mean, I was, we are from the cold country. There's another Norwegian here. I mean, it's cold weather. I mean, we are stoic. We are Vikings. We are lions, not lambs. I mean, I was not comfortable with love. I was not comfortable with into me see. intimacy so we cover up we put on a face we learn to survive because it's cold weather but after this baptism of love when i came up from this floor waves of liquid love just went off touched the 12 year old healed went to my whole life and just brought waves and waves of healing and then after was an audible voice from heaven an audible voice from heaven that says life you're my and you're my beloved, you're my beloved son, not servant, not apostle, not doctor, but you're my beloved son. I love you. I like you. I delight in you. And then he said something, and this is when it clicked that transformed me. He says, I am well pleased with you. And it was the first time in my life that I knew that Papa, Papa God, was well pleased with me. Before then, I visited chair number one, but it was just visitation. I didn't know how to have habitation. Now I visit chair number two, but that's not my home any longer. I, I can't stay there. My wife don't like me. <laughs> she loves me, but don't like me. Okay? My dog even doesn't like me. He's just like. Even my dog knows the difference. But when I'm here, receiving love, becoming love. When I'm here, whoa, with a dove. When I'm here and I've seen the Father's face, the way I'm looking at your face is different. When I'm looking at your face, after I've seen his face, I see all of these beautiful people that are made in his image. Something changes after I've taken one look at his face. It changes everything. And it is time for you to see you the way that he sees you. And for you to think about you the way he thinks about you. I think what we're going to do, I know we have a whole team from Bethel here, and we're going to pray for the sick, but I do sensing if you're going to be here for this week, and we're going to take our time, and we're going to see what has happened with at least 100,000 other individuals. Their life has been changed by love. It's a new reformation coming. Revival touches churches and community. Reformation changes culture. In chair number one, you will see that it is the Father's will to heal. In chair number one, He is my provider, He is my strength, He is my sufficiency. He is my abundance. He is my peace. He is my joy. He is my love. Whoa! My father says, all that I have is yours. So let's stand to our feet, hold out our hands, just as a... We just also want to remind you that we have a couple of books or tools that can help you out there, just in case there's a room there later on for the weekend. I just want to give away to a couple of people a couple of things. Uh, this book is called Healing the Orphan Spirit. I just, you were on Papa God's Most Wanted list, and you got the baptism of love. <laughs> I, I've, I want you to see... 
the first Reformation, next year we celebrate 500 years. I know many of you in this room, and if you're not saved, you're also going to get saved tonight. It is justification by faith and grace alone. The salvation is a love gift to be received. How many of you are grateful you are saved by grace? Just wave to me, okay. The second Reformation was the Reformation of Power. Azusa Street, and they just celebrated Azusa now 110 years, the Holy Spirit. Before that, the Spirit was in them. Now the Spirit is upon them. And the Holy Spirit upon you, the purpose for that is so that you can live the Jesus life. The power where the supernatural is natural. But there is another baptism love still, even if we had that, we didn't change the culture. But there's coming another reformation. It's called the Agape Reformation. Amen. The first one restored Jesus. The second one restored the Holy Spirit. The next one is going to restore Papa, the Father. And when the Father is being restored, it's going to stop the curse in the land. And this wave of love is going to sweep. It's going to be a goodness revolution that is going to also spread in America. Because the goodness of God leads to repentance. It's going to be a major repentance. And a billion soul harvest is coming in. So you need to fasten your seatbelt and get in on it right now. Because these waves of liquid love is going to sweep into your life, into your marriages. It's going to sweep everywhere. And the world will see we are yeah. his disciples because we have learned how to love well. We have learned how to love one another. So I want to challenge you. If you're sensing that I want that, and I want you just, I think we're going to make room up here on the floor. But I'm sensing that let's be, even before we play, I think we're going to play the love letter from Papa. So if you are sensing, if you want that, come up here and just stand and hold your hands. If you're sensing, and if not, we walk in your shadow and people will be healed. Because if you don't have any love deficiency, you don't have God deficiency because God is love. So let's just take a few more. Oh, there you have it. It's going to come more. Whoa. whoa. <laughs> That's okay. Just rest in it. It's good. It's more. <laughs> Show. And if I can have also all the Bethel people here, and afterwards we're going to pray for the sick and everything else. But, whoa, I freely I receive, freely I give. The words you are about to experience are true. They will change sure. your life. Just listen. If you let them. Whoa, just listen. For they come from the very heart of God. Shh. Just feel this. He loves you. And he is the father you have been looking for all your life. This is his love letter to you. My child, you may not know me, but I know everything about you. I know when you sit down and when you rise up. I'm familiar with all your ways. Even the very hairs on your head are numbered. For you were made in my image. In me you live and move and have your being. For you were my offspring. I knew you even before you were conceived. I chose you when I planned creation. You were not a mistake. For all your days are written in my book. I determined the exact time of your birth and where you would live. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. I knit you together in your mother's womb and brought you forth on the day you were born. I have been misrepresented by those who don't know me. I am not distant and angry, but am the complete expression of love. And it is my desire to lavish my love on you, simply because you are my child and I am your father. I offer you more than your earthly father ever could, for I am the perfect father. Every good gift that you receive comes from my hand, for I am your provider and I meet all your needs. 
My plan for your future has always been filled with hope because I love you with an everlasting love. My thoughts toward you are countless as the sand on the seashore, and I rejoice over you with singing. I will never stop doing good to you, for you are my treasured possession. I desire to establish you with all my heart and all my soul, and I want to show you great and marvelous things. If you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. Delight in me and I will give you the desires of your heart, for it is I who gave you those desires. I am able to do more for you than you could possibly imagine, for I am your greatest encourager. I am also the Father who comforts you in all your troubles. When you are broken hearted, I am close to you. As a shepherd carries a lamb, I have carried you close to my heart. One day, I will wipe away every tear from your eyes, and I'll take away all the pain you have suffered on this earth. I am your Father, and I love you even as I love my Son Jesus. For in Jesus, my love for you is revealed. He is the exact representation of my being. He came to demonstrate that I am for you, not against you, and to tell you that I am not counting your sins. Jesus died so that you and I could be reconciled. His death was the ultimate expression of my love for you. I gave up everything I love that I might gain your love. If you receive the gift of my son Jesus, you receive me. And nothing will ever separate you from my love again. Come home and I'll throw the biggest party heaven has ever seen. I have always been father and will always be father. My question is, will you be my child? I am waiting for you. Love, your dad, Almighty God. Wow, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> As life's just going through praying, we have the Bethel students come up, and if you, whatever you feel, if, if you want to, uh, if you guys want to point anybody out or go up and pray for some people. If I can get you guys to just come up here. And then um, they might want to get prayed for. Yeah, anybody on your team wants to get prayed for, get prayed for. That's cool, too. But um, so they're going to um, they're gonna be praying over people. You guys just do something soft behind. And then when they're done, just take off. And so if you can help with that sound, man, you're the main, main guy in charge here. If you can uh, make sure that. These guys are well heard, and then after after they're done, they just bring the music in, and we just continue praying and watching God move. Come on, Holy Spirit, we just thank you. You're so welcome here. Holy Spirit, just have your way, and we thank you that you're healing in this place, and we thank you, Father, that you're moving in this place, and we say there's nothing better, Lord, nothing better than dwelling in your house, nothing better than being your house. Nothing better than being your bride in your temple, God. We thank you for all the words that are going to be released in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Just make sure you can hear this real good, Gary. going to go in and let's go pray for now. Thank you, Lord. Just release it now. Now, release your love. We need some more catchers. If I can get some catchers in here. Jeff, uh, any of the leaders, if I can get some catchers, just 
make sure that everybody that's praying, somebody's behind them. So if we can have one of our catchers stay with one of the Bethel students and you guys be a team, please, that would be wonderful. Good job. What happened, Jeremy? All right. Look at that.
so amazing and this joy I can't explain it I'm caught up in the fellowship I'm caught up in the fellowship Jesus the love is so amazing and this joy I can't explain it Mi 